turn me not away. Receive me, though unworthy. Ah, turn me not away. Receive me, though unworthy. Hear thou my cry. Hear thou my cry. Be my distress. Answer me from thy throne. Haste thee, Lord, to mine aid. Thy pity show in my deep anguish. Thy pity show in my deep anguish. Let not the sword of vengeance smite me. The righteous thine anger, O Lord, shield me in danger, or regard me. On thee, Lord, alone will I call. O divine Redeemer, O divine Redeemer, I pray thee grant me pardon and remember not, remember not my sins. Forgive me, O divine Redeemer, I pray thee grant me pardon and remember not, remember not, O Lord, my sins. Night gathers round my soul, fearful I cry to thee. Come to my aid, O Lord, haste thee, Lord, haste to help me. Hear my cry, hear my cry, save me, Lord, in thy mercy. Hear my cry, hear my cry. Come and save me, O Lord. O divine Redeemer, O divine Redeemer, I pray thee grant me pardon and remember not, remember not, O Lord, my sins. Save in the day of retribution, from death shield thou me, O my God, O divine Redeemer, have mercy. Wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, uns unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, 
willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. And for Mark's gospel this day, we have Jesus again foretelling his death and resurrection. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be the last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, whoever welcomes not me, whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. On any given Sunday, ministers often wonder, wherever they are preaching, what brought you to church this morning? What made you decide to come? Or what made you decide to come here? Now here, of course, in our number that we presently have, we know pretty much why everyone is here. And that is because of your faith and your devotion over the years to this church, your commitment to this church, all of which means so very much. But sometimes a person comes because a friend has invited them, and we are thrilled when that happens. Or maybe you simply come out of habit, perhaps a personal need or a deep desire brought you here this day. And these are all good reasons for coming here. But I hope there is another deeper reason that you are here. And as we consider what brought us here this day, Let's look at where we've been, and let's look at the church itself for a moment, where it's been and where it's going. And this is the church universal. And think about what all churches have to offer in this day and time. And these words and thoughts are inspired by William Willimon, who was the head of Duke Divinity School for many years, he was rated one of the top 10 preachers in the United States, and he was in Omaha some years ago, uh, and it was quite wonderful for all of us to get to listen to him in person and think about the things he was saying. So some of this comes from that wonderful get-together with him. And he reminded us that by the year 2000, the church had just lived through what was called the greatest Christian century. That's what it was expected to be. And in many cases, it was. Christianity during that 100-year period was supposed to have spread down over the globe like those Sherwin-Williams paint ads that you may remember from the past, where all the different colors of the world slowly floated down over the globe of the earth. Well, American churches were always considered sleeping giants. They had power and prestige. They were opinion makers. Even in New York City for many years, uh, I don't know when they actually stopped it, but they used to publish on Monday the sermons of some of the ministers at the top churches so that if you hadn't been to your church, 
this is before the internet, of course, uh, or if you simply wanted to hear what multiple ministers were saying and thinking about our world, you could read it. And as a young person in the 1950s and 60s, William Willimon's parents never had to worry about his growing up without a Christian framework for his life. For you, as well as I, may remember the same thing, and that was that on a Sunday night especially, there were youth groups, and you didn't want to miss being at that youth group because it was usually the only game in town, and you were considered an odd man out if you weren't a Christian. And then by the 1980s, Somehow we began to feel out of place in a culture that we felt we'd owned. The government began to distance itself from us, and all these decisions came down. No prayer in the schools, no manger in the public square at Christmas, no Ten Commandments on display, which I list here without any prejudice about them. And we began to feel like misfits and feel out of place. And government essentially came to say, if you want your children to be Christians, then do it yourself. We're not going to help you. And schools began scheduling sports on Sundays. When I came out to this area first, I was aware that the Plattsmouth Presbyterian Church, like many churches, had big Wednesday night programs because you couldn't count on having youth on Sunday anymore. They were involved in a myriad of sports. And so the churches maneuvered around it uh, and managed to have big Wednesday night programs for all ages. And then we began to see independent denominations rise up whose names we'd never heard of, and they were springing up and doing well. And everything from grocery stores to car showrooms were open on Sunday. All business was open on the Sabbath. I remember growing up in West Virginia when we had what was called blue laws, and that meant everything was closed on a Sunday. In our small town, we had one little kind of stationary store. I guess that's what they sold. Uh, And... The B&O Railroad train would come in earlier on Sunday mornings, and they would drop off copies, a few copies, uh, of the New York Times, of the Washington Post, and of the Cumberland, Maryland paper, Sunday paper, which was across the river. These papers were not delivered to anybody. The idea that they would be delivered to you were, was like uh, a thought from another planet. So if you wanted one of those papers, then after church, meaning at 12 noon for a short period of time, uh, you came down to the stationery store, and with all the lights off, except a little bit of light near the register, the owner would sell you whatever paper you wanted, or multiple papers. And if you thought all of a sudden, oh, I need another notebook for school, and, or a get well card for someone, and went off to the other area and found it and brought it to him and asked if you could buy it, um, he, he would be uh, very negative and say, no, he couldn't open the register for that. So it, the world has changed tremendously. And so we gather here today wondering, how do we face the world? What is the description or the metaphor for who we are as we find ourselves in this time and place? Perhaps the best way to describe ourselves is that we are strangers in a strange land. The world has become multicultural. Christianity has slipped as the dominant religion in this country. By the year 2000, there were more people of different religious faiths in this country than Christian. So we cannot help but ask ourselves, who are we as Christians? Well, believe it or not, this time offers some wonderful possibilities and potential. Who are we? Among other things, we are missionaries. Every church is essentially a mission outpost. And whether we are church folk or pastors, we're strangers in a strange land and missionaries there 
in that world, in that land, to meet the world. Well, if we find ourselves as missionaries, then what is our message? What is the central issue we are up against in society? The issue most people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s has to decide today is, what will rule my life? What will reign over me? What do I really want, and what am I going to do to get what I want? What will guide my decisions? Will desire for upscale living and consumerism be the themes that guide a life? Will consumption of things or religion, meaning a devotion to something far greater than ourselves and our choices, will that determine our life and our world? It's a very difficult decision. And with all of the technology sweeping over us all the time, it's very hard to find a quiet space with nothing going on on the TV, on our cell, on the internet, to actually think about these things. Anyone who actually carves out time in their day, in their 20s or 30s or 40s, to think about that deserves an award or a medal. Because our society tells us the, the reason for getting out of bed in the morning is to get money, to live, and to build our lifestyle, and to consume, and to get up to a certain level, to buy stuff. Toys are us was a, a popular store. Consumption is us. And by the 1990s, in places like Bellevue and Papillion that were still, and farther up, of course, in West Omaha that is still always developing, new houses now had three car garages, generally. And sometimes there were more cars in a family than people in the family. And I always can't help but think about it this time of year, but there are young people who have never known what it is like to live without air conditioning. I don't need to say any more. So we are strangers in a strange land, and we wrestle with the question of, how do we tell this Christian story? How do we share the good news of our Lord and of the gospel? Well, part of our challenge of talking about Christianity is that it takes time. Christianity is not a 20-second soundbite or several versions of a commercial that can be blurbed uh, and blasted at us before an election. But to share the deep message of Christianity means using words like grace, mediation, sanctification, and defining and expanding on them. And a newcomer to the, to the faith needs to hear those words to learn that vocabulary. And it can be a slow and frustrating process. Even to talk about Christianity and the message of Christ can be heard these days as unpleasant, even combative, because our world is so combative. And think of Christ's words, blessed are the poor. To put it in a modern day translation, it can act, we can actually be saying to someone, blessed are you if you're unemployed. Blessed are you if you're going through personal or marital difficulties. And that can seem like an uncaring, abrasive message. And yet, we can suggest that as bad as a personal time may be, those are often the times in which we have transforming moments of faith. We can experience Christ's presence with us in whatever present circumstances we find ourselves. And that can be one of the greatest blessings and sometimes one of the only blessings we have during a difficult period, such as the illness and the death of someone whom we love, we can still know that Christ is for us, no matter what going on in the world or health or employment or personal problems and issues is against us. And that's a message that the church can really lift up, that we have something to offer when you're not in a pleasant, feel-good atmosphere and environment, that we offer something other than entertainment 
and that we offer a Christ who can meet you in the tough times and the tough places. William Willimon was also able to point out with us when he was here that we need a new awareness also of what it's like to be Christ's disciple. And the church always is inventing itself and reinventing itself, and that's good. If you remember in the 1990s, all of a sudden we had small groups. And I can remember when I was entering my minister ministry, we were told basically that the small group ministry is the vehicle that is really going to shore up and strengthen the church. And it's true, because it's important for people to be together in small groups and to support each other in fellowship as Christians. After all, there were small groups meeting in the catacombs. And that is how, and in uh, Christians early in, worshipped in the early days, and also in the house church movement in England. College campuses are often a place where we see new trends starting that are going to help the church. And William Willimon reminded us that at Duke and other places, there were covenant groups that started. They were also called holiness groups where people would agree to be with each other or if they couldn't to pray with each other at a certain time on certain subjects or simply just open themselves to hearing what God wanted for them at that time and place. In fact, that's something we've done at times through the newsletter where we've taken, used the newsletter as an opportunity to, at noon, pray for three minutes in this way, three minutes for that way, three minutes in another way or on another subject, as well as being invited to pray together for an end to the wildfires, for rain, blessed rain, to fall on Colorado and all these other places. But these are things that strengthen us as Christians and the way we live out our Christian life in these days. And they give us a new sense of the necessity of the Christian life. One of the great long-term ministers of the New York City Madison Avenue Church where I was ordained was to break it down into the simplest equation there is. And that was the idea that you basically need the church to get through life. You need the church to get through life. The great reformer Martin Luther was to say, we are all priests. You see signs now in some places, share human kindness. And that's a wonderful priestly statement and feeling to share with others, reminding us that we are all ministers. We are all strangers in a strange land and the wonderful thing about the church is that it supports us and nurtures us. And there is something in general that's wonderful about churches. Where else can someone walk in the door feeling that they're going to be heard, no matter how crazy or angry or hurt or ugly or sorrowful they am? Churches are a haven for the troubled, the lonely, the lost, the weird. All are welcome here. And we are also still here, just like the Statue of Liberty in the harbor after 9-11, beckoning to give me your tired, your poor. And could we not at this time even especially reach out to the new poor among us, those who have come from Afghanistan seeking sanctuary and who now are here having helped us and loved us in Afghanistan, can we not return the love and the help. So as strangers in a strange land, what must we do? Well, we are the church of the future and we need to equip the saints and that's you and me. And we need to have spiritual equipment for those. For we are living in the world with those who have had great, great loss. Whether they've lost their job, whether they've lost their country, as those coming from Afghanistan have, whether they've experienced family burdens or illnesses, or the increasing loss from within the pandemic, or in these times when we celebrate anniversaries of 9-11 and we realize that the world is not a safe place, and we need to be reminded that no matter what happens in the world, we are not alone. 
So as Christians, we know and celebrate the good news. If we look around, we see evil, blood, injustice, and death. But the church and the gospel has a response for you that goes deep. And that is the good news that Jesus overcame evil, blood, injustice, and death. And with him, so will we. Jesus rose again from the dead and sent the Holy Spirit to love, to comfort, to guide, direct, and empower his people and his church. And if the Bible were just about fairy tale people in a fairy tale world, it wouldn't have much relevance or hope for us or for anyone. But Jesus overcame the world. And through the Spirit, Spirit, we have all the help we need for the living of our days as strangers in a land and for all those displaced people who are here with us from other places and other lands. And finally, the church has something tremendous to offer anyone who comes through the door for the living of their days, and that is Christian hope. When the Easter Bunny has hopped away and Santa has come and gone and the presents are lying strewn on the floor, then amid all the discontinuity around us, the church has never had a better chance to be poised to offer its gift of hope to a world languishing and longing for its message and only just beginning to recognize its need. We live and worship with a church that has probably changed more in the last 20 or 30 years than it did in the 2000 that went before it. And yet this still may be the most exciting time for the church to get out its message to the world. What brought you to church this morning? I hope it is the message of hope that we proclaim. I hope that is what you have found this morning, a message of hope and the source of our great joy, and that is Jesus the Christ, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And nothing can separate us from his love. That is what the Apostle Paul shares with us. And he invites you into closer fellowship with him. And he longs to be in deeper relationship and on a closer walk with you. And for that great and joyous gift of his presence with us always in all times and places, we give God our thanks and praise this day. Amen and amen.